Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. My name is Crown and today we are going to have some more stories that I hope that you will enjoy. But before we start, it would be so much appreciated if you would subscribe to the channel, like the video if you enjoyed it and maybe leave a comment down below. These simple clicks would mean a lot to the future of this channel and really reward the effort that I put in every day. And now, without further ado, let's go! This was father-in-law's pity revenge. It happened in the 1980s or early 90s. He owned a trucking company but also drove one of the smaller trucks himself because he enjoyed it. My mother-in-law rode with him most days. She was there when this event happened. One morning, they arrived at a customer's loading dock at the end of an alleyway and father-in-law was maneuvering so that he could back up to the dock to unload his truck. While this was going on a mobile, the food truck driver came down the alley. The coach driver saw a temporary gap between father-in-law's truck and a building and shot through it while father-in-law's truck was moving. And he parked his coach in the dock area so that father-in-law could no longer reach the dock without hitting the coach or a building. Father-in-law stopped the truck and approached the roach coach driver to ask him to move so that he could reach the dock. The coach driver could then park and both could leave when they were ready to. The roach coach driver refused and said that he would move when he was ready to leave and told father-in-law to deal with it. So father-in-law did exactly that. He proceeded to unload using the truck's lift and a hand truck. Of course, for safety reasons, he had to break it up into multiple trips to avoid injuring himself. And after unloading the truck, he had to bring the load into the building in multiple trips. The building ramp was not that close, so that took time too. Basically, this 20-minute job was going to take at least an hour or more. The roach coach driver finished his business and was ready to move on to his next site long before father-in-law was done. Unfortunately for him, the gap he had shot through while father-in-law's truck was moving was no longer wide enough for his coach. The roach coach driver asked my father-in-law to move, and he did not ask nicely. In fact, he used words like, you old jerk. Father-in-law's answer was that he would move when he was finished unloading. Roach coach driver could see how long that was going to take and was not having it. So he tried to hurry my father-in-law by criticizing the size of the loads on the hand truck and how fast my father-in-law was working. My father-in-law just completely stopped unloading each time the driver spoke to him, nodded his head to acknowledge he heard, then carried on doing exactly as he was doing. Each time the roach coach driver interrupted him, it made the job take that much longer. Next, the coach driver stopped trying to convince him and just used swears, insults and threats. Same result. Finally, the other driver decided that if father-in-law wouldn't bend to his will, then the laws of space and time must. Yes, he got into the roach coach and decided to ram it through the gap between the building and my father-in-law truck to get into the alleyway. And it worked. Kind of. The roach coach got through but had massive damage down both sides. The roach coach driver, who was in such a hurry before, stopped, now blocking the alley, and tried to blame father-in-law for the damage to his coach. Roach coach driver was refusing to move until my father-in-law agreed to pay for the damages. But my father-in-law calmly pointed out that he was not going to accept any blame, but would be glad to exchange insurance information the roach coach driver started again with a swearing and insults. Father-in-law simply got back into his truck, locked the doors and waited calmly while he and mother-in-law had an early brown bag lunch. Father-in-law figured that someone would eventually need to get into the alley slash dock area and call the police to make this guy move. He did not have to wait long before someone called the police. It was the roach coach driver. When the police arrived, the roach coach driver demanded they arrest my father-in-law for preventing him from doing business by blocking him in and taking too long to unload. Then he claimed my father-in-law deliberately damaged his food truck. There were witnesses on the dock who saw the whole thing. 
so there was no worry that my father-in-law was in any trouble. But the fool doubled down. He was so sure he was in a riot that he didn't even bother to lie to the police about what happened. It makes it real easy to determine fault when the at the fault party admits to the police. Loudly, repeatedly, and in front of the witnesses, he got thrown in the back of a police car in the end. That was hilarious. So here is the story. The cast of characters. Ellie, me, Tom, my boyfriend, Liz, Tom's mom, John, Tom's friend, Jane, John's wife, their next wife, Sharon, John's girlfriend. John and Jane lived on top of a mountain. There are only two roads that lead up the mountain and they are a nightmare to drive. A few months after they married, a storm hit and washed out one of the roads. This led to a lot of traffic. So John and Jane moved in with Jane's sister. Karen is not the most pleasant person to live with and she has a small place so the living arrangements weren't great. I had just bought my first house. A 2500 square feet, 3 bedroom, 2 bathroom house on an acre of property. It also had a sunroom along with two 3 car garages. One attached, the other detached. Almost my dream home. I was only 25, I had a decent paying job, I spent the last 4 years living with my parents and put away 75% to 90% of my paycheck for the down payment. I also spent those 4 years building my credit so I was able to get an interest rate most people only dream of. I also had a little luck, the housing market just had a downturn. The previous owner of this house had passed away and her daughter just wanted the house gone. I bought the house for $190,000, which is a steal in the area, on a conventional loan. I have put down 20% for a down payment. This becomes important later. Tom proposed to me and moved in with me. Tom and I felt this house was perfect to raise a family in. Due to John and Jane both having jobs at the bottom of the mountain, they both decided it would be better to find a place to live at the bottom of the mountain. I had a spare bedroom in my house, so I offered to rent it out to them. The plan was to rent the room so they could save up for the down payment for their own house. Backstory on John Before Jane, John had married before and had a son. Unfortunately, on a drive down the mountain, his wife, son and sister were all killed in a car accident. John had been severely injured. John and his wife were weeks away from buying their first home when the accident happened. Due to the accident, the purchase fell through. The house they were going to buy was an extra home belonging to John's mom. So John and Jane rent a room in my house. Everything is great until they get divorced. John decides to continue renting out the room until he can figure out what to do next. A few months later, John decides to look for love again and meets Sharon. He had known her as an acquaintance before, so he decided to try a relationship with her. This is where things start to go wrong. Background on Sharon. She's in a wheelchair due to spina bifida. She had been working at the customer service desk at a big box retailer, but decided to go on disability instead. I know some parts don't add up, but this is what she told me, so I'm sticking with it. A week after their first date, Sharon moves in with John into the room. A few weeks after meeting Sharon, I get this impression of entitlement off of her. Her story of being on disability didn't sit right with me. She had expressed that she wanted to go back to school but forgot to turn in some important paperwork. She's sitting in my house watching TV and playing video games all day. How do you forget something so important? Fast forward a few months later and Tom lands his dream job. Unfortunately, it's 50 miles away and we live in one of the worst traffic areas in the US. Upside, it's a significant pay increase. Tom decides for the time being he'll commute. Due to his pay increase, Tom is able to pay more of the bills and talks me into getting a new car. I was in need of one anyway. We go down to the dealership and I come home with a brand new car. John and Sharon are quite surprised. Tom and I also have two dogs, a Great Dane and a Terrier Mix. Anyone who has a large dog knows how difficult it is to find a rental. 
A few months after moving in, Sharon asked what permission I had to get from the owner to allow my dogs to stay. I tell her that I'm the homeowner, and she seemed very surprised. I had assumed that John told her, but I guess not. This was the start of the trouble. After months of commuting, Tom and I decided it would be better to sell my house and buy a new one near Tom's job. My job is easily transferable to anywhere. I tell John that I have plans to sell my house sometime within the next six months, so he needs to find a new place. And John decides it is time to buy a house. A few weeks later, the following conversation ensues. John asks me, Will you take 150k for the house? Um, no. That's how much I owe on the place. I'll be losing money. Okay, will you take 200k? No. That's how much I bought this place for. I've made improvements and housing prices have gone up in the area. He tells me, Sharon loves this place. It's perfect for her. It's mostly ADA compliant and the open concept and wide holes are perfect for her. Then tell her you can't afford this house and find her a house you can afford. Well, my mom let me have her house for half price. I'm not your mom. The house is appraised at 280k and that will be my asking price. You are more than welcome to put in an offer when it comes on the market. Tom told me a similar conversation ensued with him as well. Sharon had even tried to backhandedly talk me into selling them my house. One day I was preparing myself lunch, a sandwich and salad and I went to my garden to go pick some tomatoes. Sharon said that she'd like to have her own garden, along with a lot of space for her dog to run around, both inside and outside. And I just replied, well, I hope John can find a place like that, that he can afford. Specifically, putting an emphasis on afford. The next month, John doesn't pay me the rent. He claims that his employer stiffed him and that he's filed grievances with his union. He shows me the paperwork and the same thing happens next month. I tell him no problem. Just pay me when he gets his back pay. The third month rolls around and I ask for the rent. He tells me he hasn't gotten his back pay yet. A week later, a delivery for a new smartphone comes for Sharon with John's name on it. And the following week, I saw doggy bags in the fridge for a pretty high-end restaurant. The fourth month comes and I ask for the rent. John makes a claim that there is parts of the house that are not ADA compliant for Sharon. I remind him that Sharon is not on the lease and technically, I can kick her out because she's overstayed her guest welcome. Plus, she's been here for a while. Why is this the first time I'm hearing about these complaints? And John leaves the room. During the second month, Liz comes over with a friend of hers. Both their cars need new spark plugs. So does my car and Tom's car. Tom agrees to change them as long as everyone buys their own plugs. John asks if he could have his change too and Tom agrees to do so. Liz and her friend decide to go to the parts shop for us to get parts while her friend offers to go get us all lunch. When they got back, we would all pay them back. And we all paid them, except John and Sharon. John tells Liz what's going on, and Liz tells him to pay her once he gets his back pay. Liz and her friend give back the money for Tom and mine's cars and lunch. They said to consider a payment for the labor. Quick backstory on Liz and John. John's mom has enough wedding rings for each finger in both hands. Most of the husbands were very questionable and weren't exactly dead material. John's mom wasn't exactly motherly material either. When John met Tom's family, they took him in and treated him like another member of the family. John has often looked to Liz for advice and motherly support. After two months of no payments and no responses from John, Liz texts and emails him to ask when she's going to be paid for the spark plug and lunch. John never responds. This is when we tell her what's been going on. Liz sends John an email saying that she's going to disown him since he's asked her for motherly support. This is something she does not approve of. She can take the monetary loss but it's the principle of what he's doing and that she's also very upset about where he's spending the money. In the fifth month, I asked John for the rent again. He says something about me wronging him. 
I remind him that this event happened over a year ago, and it was for a problem he complained to me about. I contacted the contractor to come fix the problem, and I had given him a week's notice about the contractor. John then tries to play the sympathy card, saying that I should be more aware of his personal problems. I asked him if he had rented the regular apartment instead of me. Do you think the landlord cares about his personal problems? When he buys a house, is a mortgage company going to care? I relay Liz's message to him. I also remind John that wasn't the point of renting a room from me. Instead of an apartment to us to save up money for a down payment, so pay me out of that savings account. And John refuses to answer. Then I tell him I better be paid in a week. A week later, I'm asking for the rent again. John tries the excuse that I wronged him over a year ago. I present him with his free day eviction notice. John tries to make an excuse that I cannot evict Sharon because she's disabled. I remind him that she's his guest. If he goes, she goes. I tell him if I don't have at least half my money in three days, I'm changing the locks. Two days later, there is a moving truck in a driveway. Although I cannot prove it, I have a feeling Sharon put the idea in John's head to not pay me. It is a nice coincidence that John stops paying me shortly after Sharon finds out that I'm the homeowner. Sharon had never lived in a house before, only apartments. When I confronted John about unpaid rent, she seemed very content and not surprised. Somehow I also believe that Sharon thinks my parents bought me my house. During a confrontation, John has said that I had my parents' help. My parents helped me find, negotiate, and fill out paperwork for my house, but did not contribute any money. My parents do not believe that parents should buy their children luxury items like houses and cars. Tom and Liz showed me that although I would win in court, it would cost me more money to get my money back than the money I was owed. So I took the loss. Within a matter of months, John went from being Tom's choice for his best man to being uninvited from our wedding. After evicting him, John went to a mutual friend for help, but the friend wanted nothing to do with it. Apparently, John had done a similar thing to the friend years prior, but everyone was told it was a bad misunderstanding. Due to being uninvited and going to the friend for help, the news spread quickly among our friends. For a year, John and Sharon were not invited to any parties or get-togethers. We have since run into them at some parties, but I try to avoid them to avoid confrontation. I think John has finally realized how much he relied on friends for certain things, and how he's burned those bridges. Those burned bridges have cost him both financially and in friends. Unfortunately, those bridges are burned beyond repair. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.